Hey folks. About to have a conversation. About to have a conversation with journalist David Heath. Very excited. Very excited. Yes, I'm very excited because um, this is the type of stuff. Why is this not? This is the type of stuff that I want to be talking about. And we talk about it on my radio show, but it's like, how do we have longer conversations? Oh my God, my back hurts so bad. Ugh. How do we have longer conversations, right? Let me tell the Instagram people because they need to know. Meet me at youtube.com. Amanda Seals TV. Oh, I used to be able to like add a picture, but I'm like not able to anymore. That's interesting. All right, everybody, um, head on over to YouTube, Amanda Seals TV. We're about to have a conversation uh, with journalist and author David Heath who said something that I thought just was like really kind of impactful. You know, we are we are all trying to figure out like what to do with this election, et cetera. And um, he said something, he said basically that today the Republicans had a failed impeachment and that they, thank you for the badge, and that they um, also ended up not passing a bill that they, put in in play. And he said, Republicans don't know how to govern and it's because of Donald Trump. And the reason why I thought this was an interesting conversation to have is because I think a lot of us really don't fuck with Trump just on like the fact that he's just like a douchebag. Like he's an obvious douchebag, right? Like he's um, a liar, like he's a narcissist, et cetera. But I think it's really important to discuss things like actual inability to govern and the way that that um, trickles down. Okay. The way that has trickled down to like the rest of government. So come and join me. I am over here at YouTube, Amanda Seals TV. And when you come over, like, tell me, you know what I'm saying? Be like, Hey, I came over from Instagram. Hey, I came over from Instagram. You know what I'm saying? I would love to see you all over there because we are over here right now. And we're going to be talking about this. So come and join me. Come and join me. Come and join me. Bye. Oh, the link is also in my stories. So if you go on my stories and you click the link, you can also get there too. Okay. Oh, there's David. Hello. Hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm it's nice, well. nice to meet you finally. I know. It's so weird. Like you talk to people. <laughs> in like DM. the DMs. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, yeah, we know each other. And you're like, yeah. I've never like met this person in real life. Yeah. Well, here we are, David. Here we are. Um, so happy to have you. And let me just do this little thing right here. I'm gonna put the the quote that struck me. I'm gonna put the quote that struck me up on the screen because I'm learning my tech. <laughs> I'm getting techy mm -hmm. now. I can do things. Um, okay, so it's here, right? Well, first of all, um, everybody, this is David Heath. David Heath is not just a journalist. He is also the author of Long Shot, the inside story of the COVID-19 vaccine. And um, while I am doing my, my tech stuff, uh, is there anything that you would like to tell the people? Um, no, I mean, I, I was a journalist for um, quite a long time. Uh, I worked at places like CNN and USA Today for a while. <clears throat> now I'm basically a full-time social media creator. 
and uh, been following, of course, all the chaos that's been going on in the Republican Party. Right. Um, what is it that made you feel like, you know, I need to get out of like the traditional media space? Um, you know, the traditional media space is largely collapsing, you know, so a lot of major publications right now, they're just, the jobs just aren't there anymore. And, uh, you know, the LA Times just laid off a third of, I think a third of its staff. Uh, the Washington Post has just had a bunch of cuts, uh, you know. Um, so there's uh, Sports Illustrated, National Geographic, the, you know, there was a new place called The Messenger that closed down. And so it's just, you know, mainstream media is like in crisis right now. So I got to the point where I and I decided to write a book and thought, you know, uh, rather than kind of go back into that and do stuff that I sort of had been there, done that, I decided to you know kind of try to build my own brand and go onto social media and actually express my opinion for the first time, you know, uh, in my career. So why, why is it? Why do you feel like it's expressing your opinion for the first time? Because I think for a lot of people, they're like, I mean, you're a journalist, like you're always expressing yeah. your opinion. But I, you know what I mean? That's true. And the kind of journalism that I did, I, I was mostly doing investigative reporting. So I was exposing bad people. And there was no doubt, like when I, you know, would write a story, I was, you know, making, I was bringing somebody down, you know, that was the point. Um, but, you know, there are like limitations when you're in mainstream media about, uh, you know, how you present. Like, I think, for example, in the case of Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. Mainstream media is sort of handcuffed a little bit by their own, by their own culture to believe that they can't just come right out and say, call him a rapist or can't come right out and call him an insurrectionist, um, you know, or that he's, you know, um, that he's a fascist, you know, which he is like, like he's objectively speaking a fascist. And it's very hard for you know, people working at the New York Times to say that, you know, it's because that's not what we were trained to do. And when you say that's not what you were trained to do, what were you trained to do? Uh, you know, at the core, like a lot of people think that journalism is about sort of presenting both sides. And mm -hmm. that is kind of a real, I think a pretty old fashioned way of looking at journalism. I think the real thing that you're doing as a journalist is you're trying to tell the truth, you know? And a lot of times the other side is just a complete lie and you can't really give it the credibility, but you are, you're trained to, you're trained to assume, like in, like you're trained to believe that um, in this case, that the, that the major candidate for political office for the presidency of the United States, you're trained to believe that somehow that person is legitimate, you know, and that you have to treat yeah. him as a legitimate candidate when in fact he's not, you know, but the fact that, you know, 40, 50% of the country, like maybe are gonna vote for him doesn't matter because, you know, the truth is that he is all these terrible things. He wants to be a dictator. He wants to get a rid of democracy. He said he lies every day. And I think we're at a point now where we just have to be honest about that. We can't treat it as though, you know, he's like Mitt Romney or something like that. You know, he, he is, he is a unique, um, he is a unique politician who is for whatever reason, he's just trying to bring down this country. He's all about himself and it's very dangerous. Well, you said something today that um, struck me and I literally was like, let's go on live and talk about it. <laughs> um, and so I want to bring this to the stage. Uh, let me remove this. Hold on. You said House Republicans failed at a sham impeachment while killing a border security bill their own party negotiated. Today's Republicans cannot govern, and it's because of Donald Trump. And the reason why this struck me like so much is because there's so many layers <laughs> in this one piece of text that you have shared with us, right? Because there's the yeah. sham impeachment, so I would love for you to tell us why you feel it's a sham. Then there's the border security bill, and I would love for you to just inform people on how like they or and, and why you feel like they killed a bill that they negotiated. And then I would love yeah. for us to just talk about 
um, today's Republicans versus yesterday's Republicans and uh, the way in which the presence of Donald Trump has shifted how they govern. Yeah, of course. So, uh, you know, this all kind of started with Marjorie Taylor Greene. So there was a uh, budget, um, there was a debt relief bill. There, they had to re uh, increase the debt ceiling last May. Uh, and to get Marjorie Taylor Greene's vote, she actually said this, there's a video, it's actually, I actually posted it, um, that she, in order to vote for this, what she called sit, shit sandwich of a debt mm. ceiling bill, she needed payback. And one of the paybacks that she was gonna get, and she called it dessert, I need dessert, you know? And one of those desserts was impeachment. And she didn't even say who she wanted to impeach. And in fact, she's wanting to impeach a bunch of people. You know, she filed impeachment articles against Biden and about some other right. officials, like somebody, uh, like a prosecutor in DC. And she's, so, so she's got like a whole bunch of people she wants to impeach. But for whatever reason, the first one that they got, you know, to a floor vote uh, was Mayorkas. And so it was like this stupid uh, sham impeachment because to be impeached um, in the Constitution, you have to have committed a high crime or misdemeanor. You know, you mm -hmm. basically have to be showing that you're corrupt and that you're doing something for personal gain or that you're, you know, violating the law or that you're <clears throat> abusing power or there has to be something kind of because if you were just talking about do I disagree with the way this guy runs the border? Well, that's something, you know, Biden won, he gets to pick the guy who runs the border. And that's what elections are for, you know? That's what elections right. are for. So if you wanna change that guy, if you wanna get Americans out, you know, you have to elect a Republican president. That's the, that's the <laughs> way it happens. So it's a completely sham impeachment. They had never, no, there has never been an impeachment in the history of this country where there was never no allegation of high crimes or misdemeanors. And so, so why this, did it get so far? Because of this crazy thing where Donald Trump is basically running the House of Representatives. So there was, you know, for a while it sort of made sense because there was like 30 some odd Republicans who formed this Freedom Caucus. And um, they, you know, tried to use their power because the, the majority is so slim in the House with the Republicans in control, they tried to use that power to, to do all kinds of radical things, right? But now it's, and, and you tell what's, and so, and what, you know, Marjorie Taylor Green basically, I mean, I'm assuming, but she's, she's got Donald Trump's phone number. She's taking directions from him. And so she's just, whatever he wants, she'll do it. So she'll file an article of impeachment for, you know, for nothing. It's, it's all show. It's all political theater. And um, so, uh, so she filed, she actually filed the articles of impeachment and they actually originally got trashed. And then she came up with some new ones. And for whatever reason, the Republican party, I think since Mike Johnson has taken over as speaker, has started taking this stuff seriously, you know, stuff that is lun that's lunacy, you know, like impeaching a guy without any crimes or missing, you know, high crimes or misdemeanors is is anti-American. It's anti-Constitution, and um, so. But I, I don't. The part I do not understand is that why there were only three, I guess four. There were four Republicans who voted um, against the impeachment. I don't understand right. why there's not a hundred or two hundred. You know, like it should be that there should be these lunatics out there who are mm -hmm. trying to impeach somebody just for political stunts, and then there should be like people of reason. You know, that like it shouldn't be that the entire party, Republican Party, is at the beck and call of Marjorie Taylor Greene or even Donald Trump. You know, so they should have their own goals about what they want to do in office. Why did you run to be a member of Congress? Was it just to uh, take orders from some guy, at, you know, from in Florida? You know, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. Well, I think a lot of us, I know I speak for myself, none of this shit makes sense to me anymore. 
I mean, I so doesn't. much of it is is like beyond my scope of comprehension that I literally <laughs> Like I had DM'd you the other day and I was like, can you explain this to me? And you were like, what's there to explain? And I'm like, this is so nonsensical that I like I that. can't make this make sense. And so maybe I'm missing something. Yeah. Because you DM me to say, why is this the okay, case? So they were saying uh the, the lawyers were asking uh, uh, the judges were asking Trump's attorney if Trump could order SEAL Team Six to assassinate a political rival. And the attorney said, yes. Which of course, <laughs> like, you're right. So you, and that, and that didn't so make I'm any like, sense. And you're like, explain this to me. <laughs> why? I'm like, why? Why is this happening? <laughs> like, this didn't seem to me like a question that needed to be asked. So I'm like, maybe I'm missing something. I know it was, well, I think, I misunderstood what you're saying, but I think it's so absurd. It's such an absurd position. It's kind of amazing it took the Court of Appeals, you know, months to issue their opinion, because this is like a slam dunk. You know, presidents can't assassinate rivals. You know, we all know that. Um, it was easy. Presidents are not above the law. That was, that's the whole point of this country, Actually, is that we are not a king. So my question related to that is, why do you think Judge Chutkin um, is putting a pause on the, honestly, there's so many trials. Sometimes I can't keep them straight. She yeah. is the files. She's doing the files. Um, she's wait, doing no, the she's insurrection. The she's doing the, the insurrection. She's, she's doing Smith. the insurrection. Jack yeah. Jack Smith doing the insurrection. Yeah. Why do you feel like she put a pause on the trial um, and based it on like them having to appeal the immunity thing? My understanding, you know, and I'm just reading you know, the media on this, but my understanding is that if he is immune, then they couldn't have a trial. So they had to decide that issue first. It was something that only a case, it was a very unusual case where only a president could do this, you know? And um, so they had to have, they had to determine, is he immune from prosecution first. And, you know, even though everybody knew the answer from the get go, there wasn't any case law. There weren't any previous decisions because we haven't indicted previous presidents. So there was like, this had never come, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, it's it's like, this is a unique, yeah. So we we're not going around putting presidents in prison usually. So this was the first time the issue had ever reached the courts and the Supreme court now. Can, and so what's happening as I understand it, and again, I'm not an expert, but it, she had to, she didn't have a choice. She had to delay. Now, as I understand it, for just from reading clips, the Court of Appeals has made it to where um, the trial could go ahead. Like, so, okay, so this is getting into the weeds, but if Donald Trump were to appeal to the full Court of Appeals, because only three members of the Court of Appeals decided this, if they went to the full Court of Appeals, the rule, according to the opinion today, is that the trial could still go on. You know, you could still have the trial whether you're waiting for this decision. If he goes okay. to the Supreme Court, that's different. If he goes to the Supreme Court and skips that step, then um, it's still going to be delayed. And the Supreme Court may, you know, there's some speculation. The Supreme Court may just decide, yeah, th they got it right. That we don't need to, this is not something we need to weigh in on. Presidents are, we don't even have to hear the arguments. It's so bad. So it could be that this will be decided very quickly. If not, if the Supreme Court takes it and they decide to like go full blown and okay, let's brief this and let's talk about it, then we're in, in trouble of the trial being pushed so late that he could actually, right. in theory, be elected before he's tried. So you would, the voters going to the ballot box wouldn't know yet possibly if he's a crook you know, like he's been convicted of anything. <laughs> like, honestly, David, like I check out, you know, yeah. like I check out. It's like, I can't even, at this point, there's so many layers to everything. Then you add that the Democrats are on their own bullshit. So that's like a whole other level of layers. Then there's just Israel. So that's a whole right. other- that's a whole other level of yeah. 
Well, and Scott, and to go back to what you're saying about you wanted me to go to the second part, the other thing that's weird about the politics today is you had, in order to get the Ukraine aid bill through Congress and the Israel and aid to Israel and Gaza through Congress, um, Republicans insisted on a border bill. And so right. then Mitch McConnell appointed some senators, chiefly James Langford from Oklahoma, to negotiate this bill that is a bill that normally no Democrat would support because it basically does shut down the border, you know? And so- Let me, uh, let me say, if I'm, let me, correct me if I'm right. Um, yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, so basically this bill, among other things, says that no one can come through, even if it's for asylum, like there is no legal way to become an immigrant via, I mean, to, be, to become an American citizen or have access to America via the southern border. Or is it all borders? It's not that bad, but what it does do is it pretty much makes the asylum system almost impossible to succeed in. And then it gives the, basically anybody coming here and claiming asylum right now, that's not, that's not actually illegal, that's legal, that's under current law. So they get to have a hearing before a court. And sometimes those court hearings take years, you know, up to seven years yeah. to hear those cases. So those people are getting into the country. Um, this new bill essentially gets rid of that whole system and, and it makes it to where the, the standards for being a, a refugee that could be a, a, admitted legally um, are much higher. And they have uh, bureaucrats just making the decision and in some cases, I think even right at the border, they're just, they listen to them and they say, nope, you don't have a case, get out of here, you know, and you're gone. And so it is really shutting down the border. And also there's even numerically, like literally, if you have 5,000 people um, going to the border every day, which we do right now, we have that right now, then they just completely shut down the whole process. So they just close the border. I guess they still process cases, but nobody's getting it. Nobody, absolutely nobody is allowed in. And um, so they were going to put all these people in detention and kick them out immediately. That, that's, that was the bill. It was a Republican bill. It was a Donald Trump bill. I mean, it was a bill that Donald Trump would have signed in a second if he were president. But he didn't want that bill to pass because it took away, it took away this whole issue of open borders. So it was purely political. It was purely political, and uh, so at the same time that you know this Republican Party can't even are doing sham impeachments, you know, for crazy reasons that are kind of and it's really an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to Congress. It challenges the legitimacy of Congress. It challenges you know constitutional law. I mean, look, there's no respect for constitutional law. And at the same time, the this border bill got trashed just because you feel like Donald Trump, which I agree with you, Donald Trump didn't want it to pass because then the Democrats would basically get credit for what he wants credit for. Yeah. And it's not me. I'm not guessing. Donald Trump says that. Like Donald Trump says that out loud. And, um, and also a bunch of people um, admitted it. Like Troy Nils was, I think, the first, but um, he's a congressman. And they just said, we were, we're not gonna pass this because Trump doesn't want it. So this is like the most naked political move. Like it's the most cynical thing that I can remember seeing in, in a long time, because I think there are a lot of people, probably you would be, thinking, oh, this is a terrible bill. You know, we don't want this to pass. <laughs> like, this is like, because the problem with, you know, the problem with immigration to begin with is that this country is made it almost impossible to immigrate to this country anymore. Like barely anybody can get in legally anymore. So now you have people and you, at the same time, you have a refugee crisis. You have countries like 7 million people have fled Venezuela. You know, and there are people fleeing countries like El Salvador, you know, uh, and they have they can't get into this country. Like even uh, even Biden has set up a new thing where if you're from a certain country like Venezuela, 
or Cuba or Haiti or these countries, you cannot, if you try to cross the border, you're automatically denied, you're sent back, you can't come back for five years. The only way people from some countries can get in today under Biden is by flying by plane. They have to apply in their home country, they have to get approval, then they have to fly in. They cannot cross, actually literally cross the border. So this old not, oh, notion that we have open borders is complete and utter nonsense to begin with. But so you have this immigration system that doesn't allow people to immigrate here. So people are coming and using the asylum seeking thing as their way of getting in, you know, and you know, you, you could argue that's a broken system, but in trying to fix it, they basically made it even harder for anybody to um, succeed. And I'll just give you one example that is, I think, particularly egregious. And it's like, one of the questions that they have to decide now is, could you have immigrated to another country instead of the United States? Does it have to be the United States? So if you actually, let's say, that you, your life is in actual danger and you have a legitimate claim to be an asylum seeker and that you would, under today's rules, eventually get granted permission to stay in this country because of, you know, you know, because of the conditions that you were facing back in your country. Well, now they're saying, well, but could you have gone to like a, a different country? And you have to prove, no, I could only come to the United States. So it's sort of, it kind of gets rid of asylum seeking, which is, you know, just think about all the people who fled Ukraine when Russia yes. was bombing it. And, you know, millions of people, like I think 5 million people fled Ukraine. Well, the United States at this point is just like, screw you guys. We don't take, we don't take immigrants anymore. You know, we, we, you, you have to go through this ridiculous quota system process now to get into this country and you know like barely anybody qualifies and um I was, so um, i was in tijuana with this uh, organization called um it's about humanity and basically we were down there working with individuals who are stuck in that part of mexico because they're waiting for the asylum process to happen and like at, at that point um you still needed to stay a certain like uh distance like you needed to remain in the in the area in order for your asylum uh, application to continue to to function and yeah. um there were all different people there right so you have people like you said from different parts of central america there were haitians there etc but the ukrainians were literally just oh, walking through like we were that literally makes, in line with ukrainians <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> because they because they said i don't know what the quota was but they re raised the quota for Ukrainians, so they they have special yeah. privileges. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they were getting in where people, I think people who are from Afghanistan may have something similar, but I, I don't know. But anyway, so the party is so going back to your point of like why you know what's going on here, and that is Donald Trump wants nothing. He wants nothing. He wants Congress to do nothing that could make Joe Biden look good. Nothing. So it doesn't matter whether it's his like shutting down the border, Republican bill to shut down the border. He's saying no to that. Like if, if, if um, you know, if this Congress, I mean, if Biden agreed, let's say, okay, let's build a wall and let's get Mexico to pay for it. Donald Trump would be trying saying, no, don't vote for that. You know, because he's just not wanting anything that he don't, he doesn't want Biden to succeed doing anything. He actually literally said, uh, that he hopes that the economy in this country crashes this year because he thinks it would help him win the election. So, you know, um, so this is something I... Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. This is something I've never seen. I've, there's, we've never been in this kind of territory before, you know, where you have a former president off stage giving orders to individual members of Congress and them actually... And unfortunately, they picked a speaker of the House who just is willing to do it, you know, and doesn't seem to have sort of any higher level of integrity. And so until, until I guess next my year's question is, like, why is this okay? Like within, I mean, I don't know constitutional law enough to understand, but 
are left to be able to reference something. But it's interesting whenever we notice something that it's like the forefathers like just didn't consider because <laughs> it seems beyond my scope of comprehension that they would be allowed to even do this and then verbalize that they are acting on behalf of somebody who is not even in office. Um, and that they are, it's, it's somewhat of an obstruct, it's not obstruction of justice, but it's essentially obstruction of, you know, their congressional duties. Like there's just simply no, um, I mean, it just seems like there's absolutely, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. So I have a vocabulary. There's like like no responsibility on them. There's like no fiduciary, so to speak, responsibility on them to actually govern. Exactly. And, uh, you know, if anybody like, okay, when our founding fathers put together the Constitution, they didn't imagine a federal government that would be totally ineffective or incompetent. That's not what they had in mind, obviously. And anybody who's putting together a country is not going to put together a system where you have, you know, half of the politicians trying to sabotage the other half, you know, on a constant basis. And so, you know, that this Congress happens to be the least productive Congress, I think, in, I don't know if in history, but in the last hundred years or something like that, it's passed the fewest bills, 23. 23 bills have gone through, have made to this Congress and signed into law. And that's by far the fewest. And even if you look at previous um, uh, split houses, like, so if you had two parties, one party controlling the Senate, one party controlling the House, even compared to past situations like that, um, this Congress is like, like in, I'm talking about in the last year, has been just abysmal. And it's and it's really because, um, again, because they have a guy who's telling them what to do, and they don't have enough people with enough guts and courage within the party to say, you know, because, you know, who knows? Anything could happen, but it looks like Donald Trump is going to lose again, and he's been losing, you know, over I think and over and the over first again. I've heard say that. I feel like people are overwhelmed. <laughs> like, he's going to win. He's going to win. <laughs> Based on this idea that if people aren't voting for Biden, then Trump is going to win. Like that's essentially been, you know, the yeah. the the language that I keep hearing thrown around. Um, the problem and then, is, you know, is that I. Within his own party, you know, the what the New Hampshire election showed was his his you know, you know okay, Joe Biden just was in a primary in uh, South Carolina. He got ninety six percent of the vote. Okay, yeah, in Donald South Carolina, Trump, in South Carolina, Donald Trump, former president, has all these cult followers. You know, he's like he's got this thing. He got 51% of the vote in New Hampshire. So like, it's like, he's not, it's not like the Republican party is saying, yeah, this is our guy. So um, yeah, so he's very weak because independents are way against him. Like the independents all voted for Nikki Haley. Democrats aren't gonna vote for him. So it's like, he's in trouble. And, uh, and then if he, particularly if he, there's been polls that show that if he does get convicted and he'll probably at least be convicted in New York, you know, before the election. But if he does get convicted, um, a lot of people, his support drops off after that. So I think his odds are very long to win this year's election. But in the meantime, the party is, and if he does, does lose, then there's a good chance they'll lose the House. Um, they could, you know, the, the Democrats could hang on to the Senate and if they could get rid of people like, um, you know, Manchin's going to be gone. It doesn't look like Cinema is going to run again. Oh, and really? uh, yeah, she has to, she's running as an independent and she hasn't right. done any of the legwork needed to put, have the signatures that she needs to have her name on the ballot. It looks like she's just going to like go into like lobbying or something, <laughs> which she'll do, but <laughs> Um, so they'll be gone. And if, you know, had they not been, had they not been in Congress during Biden's first two years, he had a litany of very progressive legislation from uh, reforming money in politics to 
uh, reigniting the Voting Rights Act to uh, build back better, I forgot what the original name of it was, but he had like free daycare and uh, paid family leave and expanded Medicare. I mean, it was, he had a very progressive agenda that pretty much got derailed, eliminating the Trump tax cuts, making DC a state, all of that died because of two senators. Well, before we go, yes. Um, what are two th two things that you feel like are factors of that Donald Trump affects our government? Uh, I can't even talk. What are two ways in which you feel like Donald Trump negatively affects our government um, in terms of governance? Because I, again, I feel like, you know, a lot of the conversation for a lot of us is just like, I mean, he's a douchebag, like, come on. Right. But the original thing that really drew me to this post was the concept of like, he has, it's because of him that they haven't been able to govern. And I know right. that it's partly because like wielding their puppetry, yes. but I feel, like it's, I feel like it's, it's even deeper than that because it's beyond Congress and it's also the governors and the state senators and, and representatives. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think that the that the vote today that he lost and the killing of this border bill are he wanted both of them. He ordered those things. Like he basically, right. you know, it's like got in his little uh, you know, uh, opened his up his chat. browser, got his little menu thing, picked, you know, I want an impeachment, you know, I want, you know, you were to kill this border bill. He picked those and he's got people who are just willing to do whatever he says. So there's that, but I think you're right in that he has spent so much of his energy and so much of his focus on kind of destroying the idea of the constitution and destroying the idea of democracy. And unfortunately he's got, he has such a huge base that even when he's not calling you up and saying, you have to do this thing for me, um, there's so many people in Congress who will not stand up to him or for anything. So you had people like um, a Liz Cheney or Adam Kinzinger yes. who used mm -hmm. to be there. And because they saw through Donald Trump and realized he was essentially a traitor and wanted to like get rid of him, uh, they're gone, you know, they're both gone. And so that's what Republicans see. That's what, that's why the vote was so close today. It's because there are a lot of Republicans who think this is all nonsense, but because they don't want to be Liz Cheney, you know, they're going to do what Donald Trump wants. And unfortunately, and I don't know how long this is going to last. Maybe let's say, let's say he loses the next election. Will they give up on him? I don't even know. Let's say he wins I'm the next election. I'm surprised he made it back into their favor. Because after the midterms and that, you know, whole situation where basically everybody who was attached and who was uh, promoted by him didn't win. Uh, yeah. After that, I thought they were going to be like, okay, we're done. And then or after, there was an uptick. After January or, you know, 6th. <laughs> right. After January right. 6th, like who would say, the guy threatened the lives of those people. Like the people in Congress were, their, their lives were in danger. And they're like crawling back to this guy? Like what, what in the world? You know, like it was funny because in uh, one of her debates, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, when she was running for reelection, when they brought up January 6th, she said, I'm a victim of January 6th. And it's like, <laughs> it's like what? And then and said like, later that it was really just people visiting the Capitol. Well, listen, I don't feel like a victim when I'm at a museum and other people are visiting the museum. So what is it? You know, like yeah. it's, it's, the, it's the complete depravity of any level of, I'm not, I'm not even gonna talk about ethics, but just like any level of like even common sense and yeah. the, um, and the willingness of so many people who are voters to go along with it. At this point, I am, again, like I'm not, 
telling people like, you need to vote for Biden. But I really want to understand when people are like, I want to vote for Trump. Right. And so that's why I wanted to have this conversation because I just wanted to, because yeah. I feel like my only purpose at this point is just how can I make y'all laugh and learn? Like how, how can I make y'all laugh and learn? Like, I can't, I don't want to tell you what to do. Yeah. I don't, you know, all I'll tell you to do is, you know, boycott Starbucks and free Palestine, but otherwise right. it's like, <laughs> and don't twerk at brunches. There's a lot of twerking at brunches <laughs> that I needed to say. But otherwise, I'm just like, let me try and inform. And ultimately, David, I feel as though so many people are still getting their news from folks who, like you said at the beginning of this live, are not able to really be honest. And so therefore, it's not factual. And if you if you can't get your news from honest sources, then you're not able to make really informed decisions. Right. Yeah. There was a long story um, in The Guardian. Was it The Guardian? Did a long story on CNN's coverage of Israel. Did you see that? And, and, and basically internally, it's very tough for anybody at CNN to do a story sympathetic to Gaza. And uh, that's really unfortunate. I mean, I think that kind of thing is, is very unfortunate. And uh, so I do think mainstream media has a lot of flaws. And um, uh, I think that the way they cover this election could be critical in terms of, you know, how are they going to treat Donald Trump? Are they going to treat him as a legitimate guy who, you know, you ask him, what are you going to do about education? You know, like, what are your education policies? Or are you going to, like, say, look, you, you're a rapist? You're a, you're a criminal? <laughs> you're a fascist? You know, and, like, treat him that way. You know, treat him for what he is. Well, I appreciate you for what you are. And oh, I love you. that you have come to the digital media space to inform us all. And uh, if you all want to um, follow somebody that is going to keep you in the know on what you need to know, it particularly in terms of American politics, like David always posts these clips that come from C-SPAN that you're not watching. You're not <laughs> watching C-SPAN. You know who is? David Heath. <laughs> and he is... Yeah. Um, you know, keeping us up to date on a regular basis with just kind of the foolery that is taking place around us and that we need to take it under our, you know, on our backs to, to change. So I put your at in the uh, YouTube chat so you guys can follow David on Instagram. Is there anything you'd like to say to the people before we go? No, I just, I mean, I, I was, uh, I spent a long time on TikTok and then I moved over to Instagram. I love it here. So I love Instagram. I love you guys. I mean, my followers are the greatest. So I really appreciate everybody who follows me and interacts. And, and I, I just really like that. You've created a really smart space. And I really love being on your page and, and reading the comments. It's like I go to your comments because I uh -huh. learn the comments. You know, people are yeah. adding on to and the information. So thank you so much. And I will have you back. And thank you for this impromptu okay teaching yeah. session for the moment <laughs> yes i love yeah. it very, okay. very social media of you have a good night david <laughs> thanks amanda see you thank you guys so much for joining us um i have to get on a call with my therapist <laughs> and i just really want you guys to be as informed as possible remember you can check out my radio show the amanda seal show wherever you get your podcasts and in select cities. Uh, this is called the Common Sense Kickback. And I'm doing these, you know, sporadically as an extension of my space on my radio show. On the radio show, we talk about pop culture. We talk about politics. We talk about lifestyle. We talk about relationships, et cetera. Uh, but we only have like five minutes every break to do so. So often I want to be able to expand the conversations. And this was something that I was like, oh, we got to talk about it. And then the fact that David was able to come here and speak to his actual quote, even better. So I appreciate you guys for joining. And uh, thank you to everyone who bought um, the uh, super stickers. We appreciate you. And uh, just know that these are spaces that are you know, created and supported by you, the people. They're grassroots and they're coming from the truth. And um, for them to continue to be existing, they got to be upheld by by the people. So every, every dollar counts and um, every eyeball <laughs> counts. So remember to like, comment, and subscribe because that way when I do lives, you'll be notified. You can also subscribe to my Patreon. Uh, we also over there, I always let people know when I'm coming on over there. And um, 
I hope everybody has a great evening. I will be tomorrow at the Wilmington Library uh, doing a talk back. So looking forward to that and um, looking forward to doing more of this with you guys laughing and laughing. What am I saying? I'm sorry. Looking, doing, looking forward to doing more of this with you guys listening, laughing and learning. Have a good night.